um, the orthogonal elements of the quadrupole matrix vanish. <coughs> and uh, because it's absolutely symmetric, the x, x, and y, y components have to be equal. And because the sum of x, x plus y, y plus z, z must be zero, because it's traceless, then those are related to QCC. And so in the case of abnormal symmetry, there is one number that defines the whole quadruple matrix. And that is sometimes called the quadruple moment. So if one gives uh, one has abnormal symmetry, then we can specify one number uh, to specify the property. Yeah? I forgot why it was traceless again. I remember that if you trace number two in the C's on the tensor, it reduces the rank by two. Right. Well, so the, the particular, this is traceless in this case because we, we let's take the trace of this matrix. Okay? It's the trace of uh, this matrix is three. Oh, yeah, I remember. And the trace of this is r squared. So this is traceless. OK? All right. So um, we were then talking about the more, most general uh, expansion, writing it in a, uh, a more um, general form. So if we take the Green's function for uh, the uh, Poisson equation, um, then we were using just a Taylor series expansion, we were able to write this as uh, a power series where the terms then, um, these should be of order L. Each of these is, is a rank L tensor. where this tensor T has these components. And as we discussed last time, this tensor is traceless. That is to say, if I trace, if I contract over any two indices, um, I get the Laplacian of 1 over R. And Laplacian of 1 over R is 0 except where x equals x prime, but we're outside the region where x equals x prime. We're far away from the source. So the, tr the trace of this tensor with respect to any, any two indices is going to be some da da da, which is 0. So it's a traceless tensor trace with respect to any two indices, and moreover, it's symmetric. So this tensor is irreducible. Um, the, this uh, tensor is just the polynomials, just the outer products of all of the coordinates uh, associated with the source position. Um, this tensor can be, if you do this derivative, you just use the, uh, take this derivative over and over again, what you find is that this is equal to um, <coughs> xi1, xi2, dot, 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 xil, the L irreducible part of that, meaning we subtract out the trace with respect to any two indices. Okay? Divided by R to the 2L plus 1, and there's a factor here, 2L minus 1, double factorial. Oh, I missed it. I missed the minus one is the L here. All right. So this tensor is irreducible. 
this tensor is not irreducible. It's symmetric, but it's not traceless. Because if I take the trace with respect to any two indices, I'm going to get r prime squared, right? However, what we showed in problem set number one was that if you contract two tensors, then um, you only pick off the irreducible pieces, right? You remember we had that in problem set one. So if this, since this tensor is irreducible, it's only the irreducible component of P that contributes to this trace. We showed that in problem set one. So I can write this uh, sum as minus one to the L. Uh, and then I can only need to take the irreducible component of P that's the only component that contributes to this trace and contract that with T. observation and terms that depend only on the coordinates of the source. That was our intention. That was the whole goal here. And so now we can plug this back in and say what is the potential at the point of observation. Of course that is the convolution of the source with the green function or q over r in much more simplistic terms. Um, and plugging in now this term, or this expansion, for the Green's function, we see what we have. This is equal to as sum over L. Uh, this might as well to the L part of me. there's it's r to the minus one and then it keeps flipping from minus one to plus one so this minus one to the l that we should this is what happens when i try to just do this by memory that memory is failing more and more um, then okay so now i'll plug that in and what i see is the following it's so one over l factorial a tensor I'll call Q L, I1 up to I L, contracted with this tensor. Where these tensors, Q L, are the multipole 
moments to the Elmo ball. And they are defined thus, putting this all together, 2L minus 1 double factorial, the integral over the source times the irreducible part of the outer product of all the x primes. And this is the most general form of the multipole moments, the 2L to the L pole. Let's check that this agrees with what we wrote down over here. Um, so what's Q0? Well, in that case, L equals 0. So Q0 is just this, which is the total charge. Q1 has one index. L equals 1. Uh, 2 minus 1 is 1. Double factorial is 1. And what's that? That's the i component of the dipole vector, right? And then Q2 has two indices. Call them i and j. L equals 2. 4 minus 2 is 3. 3 double factorial is 3. Integral x prime i j irreducible part. And what's the irreducible part of the outer product? You subtract off one third the trace. Traces the way we did in problem set one. If we wanted to do that, we don't generally want to do that, but if we wanted to, we could. Um, finally, by convention, well, this is this isn't a true expression. We typically, because these tensors are all irreducible, we don't keep around the irreducible write this explicitly as the irreducible part of it, because that's going to automatically be picked off when you do the contraction. So tip, uh, by convention, we write This as QL I1, I2 up to the L index, and then just the outer product of all of the uh, so this is Q0 over R plus Q1. I, X, I, or R cubed plus one half Q2, I, J, X, I, X, J, or R to the fifth, etc. Which is what we have over here. It's exactly the same thing. Right? Okay, so 
This is the most general form of the multipole expansion written in terms of irreducible parts of these Cartesian tensors. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions about any of that? It's kind of messy, but it is what it is. All right? Okay, so um, one of the things that we want to talk about uh, is um, the, int the <coughs> potential energy of a localized charge distribution in an external field, okay? So you remember, and again, I want to re-emphasize this point. There are two kinds of notions that we have in electrostatics when we're talking about the potential energy. We can, we can talk about the work necessary to assemble a charge distribution. And that work is then thought of as work, it, that energy is then stored in the field associated with that charge distribution, which we wrote as 1 over 8 pi e squared as the energy density in the integrated wall of space. Now, of course, that doesn't work if you have point charges around because it takes an infinite amount of energy. And the self-energy is infinite, but you know, we'll leave that aside. Um, but there's yet a different notion, which is that I have some electric field produced from some other sources, whatever that is, and I have some charges that are in this field. Okay, there's some charge distribution rho. So this is an external field and/or potential depending on how I want to express it. Like, for example, I put a charge uh, in um, between two capacitor plates. It's going to move. It's going to have potential energy. It's going to want to roll downhill. Okay? And the potential energy associated with uh, the, this charge distribution sitting in this potential is Q times V. And, or I can write it as dq times the potential at that point. Right? So I want you to keep these two concepts straight, because they often get confused. There's two different notions that we have about the potential energy. So, of course, here, this potential is not the self-potential of this charge. This is the potential associated with the sources, these sources, okay? And since we're outside the region that produced this, we're outside the sources that produce this field, wherever these charges are, del squared phi of the external potential is zero. This is not I mean, you would, might think it's 4 pi rho. It is. It's 4 pi this rho, not this rho, because this is the potential that's generated by these sources. It's like I, you know, I have a mountain that makes a, a, a gravitational field, and then there's me, this big mass has to try to go the La Luge Trail. All right? It's not my gravitational field that I'm working against. It's the gravitational field of the Sandias that I'm working against. The only difference between these two energies is a half. which potential you use. That's right. And there's also a factor of a half. Eric Lee. Okay. So, um, right. Now, um, let's put the let's say let's put the origin somewhere here. 
doesn't matter where it is, but we just gotta fix something. Now, because our charge distribution is localized, we can do a Taylor series expansion of, of the external potential about this point. It's varying in some way. So we can Taylor expand the external potential about the R. Which I'll take to be as the center of charge. Of growth, like the center of mass. Okay? So, um, our potential thus is the potential at the origin plus uh, the first order expansion in the Taylor series. And then in the same way that we just did, the most general term in the Taylor series expansion is 1 over L factorial. And then we have L different derivatives with respect to all the coordinates of the potential evaluated at that center of mass. That's the general Taylor series expansion as a function of x, y, and z. Okay? Uh, times, ooh, the polynomial part. x1, x2, x, f. All right. So now, we look at this and we see, hmm, um, this tensor is symmetric with respect to interchange of any of the indices, because it doesn't matter what order I do the derivative in, because we're physicists. Maybe it matters, but you know, we assume things are smooth enough that it doesn't matter. Um, and of course, this is obviously symmetric, right? Because it doesn't matter what order. So it's a symmetric tensor. Moreover, what happens when I trace over any two indices? It's zero. Well, why is that? Well, because tracing over two indices going to give me, suppose I trace over the first two indices, it doesn't matter which one I do, the trace of this is sum over that index, that's del dot del, acting on phi. But we just said we're outside the source that produced this external field, thus this external field satisfies the Laplace equation and therefore this Zero. Huh? If that whole term is your tensor component, then what are the indices? Here they are. Because I see each one of them appears twice, though. Isn't that term? Uh, indeed. Uh, what I really mean to say is this tensor. Okay. You're, you're right, then. I mean, really, it's the contraction of these guys at max. That, that, that is important. Thank you for it. I'm sorry. I got that confused. Because we're about to do something based on this fact that this tensor, as now bracketed, is irreducible. Because what that means then is that I only need to take the irreducible component of this outer product. Right? For the reason we just said, if I contract two tensors and one is irreducible, it's only the irreducible piece that contributes. So now, I can plug this back into this.
that tell me the potential energy of this charge distribution in the external field is equal to the sum over L um, yeah, over L factorial, the integral over the charge distribution, rho x. One x i two up to the health guy. This is the component of that times uh, the derivatives evaluated at the center of charge, contracted over all those indices. And we just wrote down what this is. We recognize this thing. Right? That is the multipole moment. A multipole moment written here. Just up to that factor 2L plus 1 double factorial. So what we have thus is that the potential energy can be thought of as potential energies associated with each of the multipole moments. We've done a multiple expansion of the potential energy. So let's write out the first few terms of that. When L equals zero, we got Q zero times the potential at zero. That's the L equals zero term. The L equals one, we got this is one, we got Q one sub I, the partial respect to I of potential at the origin. And then we have two factorial, and this is three double factorial, so that's two times three, or one six. And then we have Q2, Ij, partial I, partial J, at the origin plus. So, we have <coughs> the following decomposition, if we have a localized charge distribution, we can express the potential energy as the interaction of each multipole component with the field or the potential. This first term is just QB. That's the total charge interacting with the potential. If the total charge is, is zero, then the next term, well, what is this? This we said, was the i component of the dipole moment. And what is the derivative with respect to i of the potential? Right. It has the electric field. Right. For the i component. It's, so remember, of course, the electric field is minus grad phi. So this is grad phi, so this is minus e. So the next term here is minus p dot e. That's the interaction of the electric dipole moment with the field, often known as minus d dot e, but here we call it p. Um, and then we got this. And of course, we got the same kind of thing. The grad respect to this is minus the electric field, the j component electric field. So then we have minus a sixth, the quadrupole tensor partial respect to I of EJ, evaluated at the origin of the last Okay, so if I have a localized charge distribution in an external field, then each 
multipole term contributes something to the energy. Uh, if I had a net charge, this would be the dominant term. If I had no net charge, this would be the next term, uh, which depends on the local electric field. And then we have, if this was zero, this would be the, the dominant term, which depends the gradient, how the field is changing across the sample at the center of charge. Okay. So you have a problem for homework in which you are asked to evaluate this for a particular case where the particular case is one where we have adamusal symmetry, in which case there are some special properties that we emphasized at the beginning of the lecture about the quadrupole tensor. You've got to use those to kind of get a handle of it. All right? Okay, we'll come back. This expression is going to be important when we think about radiation as well uh, later in the semester and thinking about um, the different multipole contributions to radiation and their interaction with radiation fields. They're familiar in thinking about, uh, in, in say, in quantum mechanics, the selection rules associated with electric dipole and for quadrupole transitions has as a space this electromagnetic physics <coughs> it's electric. Okay. <clears throat> so um, so we have uh, so far expressed um, our multipole distribution in terms of Cartesian coordinates. X, Y, or Z. That's convenient if our charges are kind of, or charge distribution is localized on, with Cartesian symmetry, like point charges on the X or Y or Z axis. But when we have things like cylindrical or spherical symmetry, it's not. Cartesian coordinates aren't typically the best thing to use. Okay? So we want to now discuss the spherical representation of the multipole extension. So to do that, we can do it in one fell swoop. Whatever a fell swoop is, we can do it. Um, does anyone know what a fell swoop is? I don't know. But that's what we do in one fell swoop. I think it's a sword. Is that right? I think so. Okay. I didn't know that. Fell swoop. So what is that fell swoop? Um, well, it's what's known as the addition theorem. <laughs> so the addition theorem of spherical harmonics. says that this function can be expressed as a power series of spherical harmonics in the following way. Sum L equals 0 to infinity, 4 pi over 2 L plus 1, R prime to the L over R to the L plus 1, times a sum N equals minus L to L, Y star Lm, theta prime, phi prime, phi Lm, theta and phi, where R is greater than R prime. Okay, so that is a identity where, uh, you know, of course, we've written here, so we, we have x has coordinates r theta and phi, and x prime has coordinates r prime, theta prime, phi prime. 
So in this one fell swoop, we have factorized the coordinates of the point of observation from the coordinates of the point of the source. That's what we spent a whole lot of time doing there in the context of Cartesian coordinates. Um, and so from this, we plug this back into uh, the expression for the potential in terms of the integral integral over the source with the Green's function. Plugging in this expansion, we immediately see this is equal to the sum over L and M, where the, it, the limits of integration are as given, 4 pi over 2L plus 1, a coefficient QLM times YLM as a function of theta and phi over R to the uh, L plus 1. And this, in one fell swoop, is the multipolar extension. Where the QLMs are the integral of the source with the prime variables. So we have an integral of dq x prime, rho of x prime, r prime to the L, y L n star, theta n phi, right, which we often write in spherical coordinates. So these objects are called the spherical multipole moments. And um, they are, for a given L, There are two L plus one QLMs because M goes from minus L to L. Okay, so for L equals zero, there's one. It's related to the monopole moment. For L equals one, there are three components related to the three components of the dipole vector. And for L equals 2, there are five QLMs. And of course, they are related in ways that we'll discuss to the 2L plus 1 irreducible <coughs> or independent components of the irreducible tensor. So even though uh, a tensor of rank L in three dimensions has, uh, what does it have, three to the L components, in, there are only two L plus one independent components because they are irreducible tensors. And those 2L plus 1 independent components of our Cartesian representation of the multiple moments are related to the 2L plus 1 spherical multiple moments. And some of those relations we'll discuss here are, are uh, given in Jackson's textbook. All right? Um, so let me just uh, note here, remember 
this is something that I, I want to re-emphasize because it's, it's sometimes, there's so many things going on, it's hard to keep track of everything. Each multipole moment, each component of a multipole moment is associated with a characteristic field and potential. So if I had a monopole, the characteristic, it's just the one over R potential with spherical equipotential surfaces. If I have a dipole, well, there's a particular shape of the uh, equipotential surfaces and a particular shape of the electric field associated with the dipole. We wrote those down last time in Cartesian coordinates. What we see here is that each QLM gives rise to a potential which has this shape. It falls off with distance like R to the L plus one. And it's the equipotential surfaces are the YLMs. Okay? So if I have a uh, monopole, Y0, 0, let's just write down a few of the, the YLMs. Let's remind ourselves. So the YLMs, as a function of theta and phi, is some normalization constant times the associated Legendre polynomial as a function of cosine of the angle theta times e to the i m phi. Okay. So, um, let's write them down. Uh, So these are the characteristic shapes of the potential associated with the different multiple components. So quite often people will call spherical harmonics multipoles. You'll hear people say that. All right. Um, now, in the particular case of abnegal symmetry, we can make a, a, a simple connection between this representation in terms of spherical coordinates and the representation that we have in terms of Cartesian coordinates. So if I have abnegal symmetry, what that means is that the potential 
doesn't depend on the equal angle phi. It's independent of that coordinate. All right? So we have some situation where as a function of phi, the potential, I'm sorry, the charge density is constant, doesn't depend on it. Um, so in that situation, what we see automatically is that uh, the QLMs, which we, which we I'll write out explicitly again, So I just wrote out the uh, YLM in terms of the Legendre function and the e to the i phi. What can you tell me about this? So if I'm integrating over phi from minus pi over 2, or from minus from 0 to pi, or 2 to 0 to 2 pi, then this is zero unless m equals zero, right? There are orthogonal functions, the exponentials. So the only non-vanishing multipoles, spherical multipoles, if I have admusal symmetry, are the QL zeros. And all of the other ones vanish because you're, there's no component M associated with the charge distribution. So that tells us that the potential as a function of uh, X is only the M equals zero terms survive. And the YL with M equals zero are related to the standard Legendre polynomials. This is equal to square root of 2L plus 1 over 4 pi times a Legendre polynomial as a function of cosine beta. There's no more phi dependence left. And so this is equal to something we call QL PL, I'm sorry, I forgot my one over R to the L plus one. Thanks. Where QL is equal to What have we shown here? If we have abnormal symmetry, then only the m equals zero terms survive. We don't have a sum over l. I'm mean, over m anymore. We only have a sum over l. Each term, the shape of the potential, its angular dependence is the Legendre polynomial as a function of the cosine of the angle weighted by what we call the elf moment. 
there's no longer a tensor. There's no longer a bunch of different QLMs. There's just one number for each moment. And that number is related to the QL zeros. Uh, when we plug all that in, put this together with this, and this is the integral d phi d cos theta. This then is equal to, I can combine this guy with this guy to get me back the Legendre polynomial. And so the QL is equal to the integral And this is what's written down in Griffith's textbook. In Griffith's textbook, he writes down this as the multiple expansion. I urge you to go back and look at it. That's what he writes down. He doesn't sort of tell you that that's really only true if you had ad lethal symmetry. And if you don't have ad lethal symmetry, you better be real careful about what you're calling this angle theta kind of can be generalized, but then that's not the usual theta. Okay. All right. But luckily, I have here still very masterfully maintained on the blackboard the Cartesian discussion <coughs> of atom using symmetry. So these guys must be related, yes. Um, so this is just a really minor note, but so if we were actually to go and perform oh, that this integration. Uh-huh, this should be too high, sorry. Uh -huh. um, so if you have the you know, d cosine theta, then you'd get like a negative um, sine theta. So that would give you negative of the normal um, volume element. And is it then just a matter of switching your limits of integration? Yes, so I was a little bit quick here. Okay. So, um, when we integrate respect to theta, um, this is our Jacobian, which I could write as minus d cos theta, but from <coughs> And the cos theta is 1 to minus 1. But then if I switch the limit of integration, okay. so when I write d cosine theta, this is the assumed limits from minus 1 to 1. But that's correct. Cool details. They need to be paid attention to. All right. So, um, what I wanted to do now is show that indeed our Cartesian expansion is equivalent to this. Firstly, for the case of azimuthal symmetry. symmetry means I only have a z component of the dipole because the x and y must vanish. 
if I have to add these in symmetry, plus a half xi xj qij over r to the fifth. And this is equal to x squared uxx plus y squared uzz plus z squared, I'm sorry, y, y, z squared uzz over r to the fifth. The off diagonal elements vanish. qxx equals qyy equals minus qzz. So this is equal to a half qzz z squared minus a half x squared plus y squared over r to the fifth. And if I add uh, a half of a z squared and subtract a half of a z squared, this then is equal to a half qzz 3z squared minus r squared over r to the fifth plus that, that, that. Okay, so my claim is this expression for the first three terms is equivalent to this expression. Is it? It better be. Let's check it out. Um, there should be a two over here. It's just three halves. So this is, if let us remember um, the relationship, we won't get our knuckles broken because we remember the relationship between z, r, and theta. So we can plug it in. If I have have the Newton symmetry at the end of the day, things only depend on the z coordinate. They can't depend on x and y. They depend on z and r. So let's plug it in. We get q over r. We get pz cos theta over r squared plus a half qzz 3 cos squared theta minus 1 over 2 r cubed plus dot dot dot. Does this agree with that expression? What is this expression? Let's go back to this board. This is equal to Q0 over R plus Q1 times P1 of cosine theta over R squared plus Q2, P2 of cosine theta over r cubed, plus dot, dot, dot. And of course, we remember the Legendre polynomials. Maybe. And p1 of cosine theta is? Cosine theta. Yay! So this is q1 cosine theta over r squared. And p2 is 3. Uh, P2 of mu is 3 mu squared minus 1 over 2. So if I plug in cosine theta, this is 3 cos squared theta minus 1 over 2 r cubed. And in fact, it has exactly the same form that we have over here, where these QLs are equal to 1 over L factorial Q Z Z Z whatever the all when all you put all the components of your Cartesian condenser equal to the three component, that's what it is for Adamus' symmetry. That defines the whole tensor. So if I have Adamus' symmetry there is one number that defines each moment. That number can be thought of as this integral, which is equivalent to 
this component of the Cartesian tensor. Finally, I want to make a more general connection between the Cartesian and the spherical tensors. And that connection is an important connection. It's a, it's a technique in thinking about what the hell spherical harmonics really mean uh, in terms of rotation symmetry and its relationship to the coordinates. Um, what I want to talk about in the last 10 plus minutes of the class is the, the relationship between spherical harmonics and what I'm going to call the spherical basis. What do I mean by this? I, those of you who are at the problem session, I alluded to this yesterday. And this is the following. Suppose I have rotation about the z-axis. Okay, so let's write down the rotation matrix. Suppose I rotate up the axis by an angle. So the rotation matrix cos sine, minus sine, cos 1. Okay? That's the rotation matrix that we wrote down when we're thinking about transformation of coordinates. This matrix can be diagonalized. What are its eigenvalues and what are its eigenvectors? So I'm looking for, if I have some vector that the, ac the action of the rotation matrix on the vector is just to get back an eigenvalue seems hard to imagine what vectors that could be, because I'm rotating around the z-axis, what vectors are left alone? Well, clearly the z-axis is left alone, so the z-axis is an eigenvector, and it just goes back to the z-axis, the eigenvalue 1. But any other vectors in the xy plane don't go back to themselves. So there are no other eigenvectors in Cartesian space that are eigenvectors rotating on the axis. But if I allow my vectors to live in a complex plane, that is to say with complex scalars, I can take superpositions with complex numbers, then there are eigenvectors. And in fact, there are three eigenvectors with eigenvalues val e to the i cubed phi, where E0 is the z-axis, that's the one we just said, goes back to itself. But there's an E plus or minus, which is the linear combination x plus or minus i E y. And I can normalize it. And by convention, that's annoying as all get out, but it's related to how the spherical harmonics are defined. There's a phase convention out front. It's not so important for understanding the geometry, but it's an important convention. Those combinations with q equals 0, 1, and minus 1, these three vectors are what's called the spherical basis. They span three-dimensional space with complex scalars. Okay? And they are obviously, because they are eigenvectors of rotation, and because the spherical harmonics 
are related to the eigenfunctions of rotation. There is clearly some relationship between them, and the relationship is important for you to understand. So, consider the complex coordinates x plus or minus as x plus or minus i, y, and z. Okay? Let's re-express these coordinates in spherical coordinates. This is r sine theta cos phi plus or minus i sine phi, right? Plugging in for x and y. Of course, cos plus i sine is e to the i phi. So this is equal to r sine theta e to the plus or minus i phi. And this is equal to r cos theta e to the i zero times phi, or r cos theta. So what we see here is that, recall in quantum mechanics, Uh, the orbital representation of the LZ operator is the derivative with respect to phi. These functions are eigenfunctions of rotation around the z-axis. That's to say, if I look at LZ as an operator acting on z, it's zero times z. Whereas LZ acting on X plus or minus IY is plus or minus 1 times. So these functions are eigenfunctions of rotation about the z-axis, which is what the YLMs are, in addition to the eigenfunctions of the total L. So, a way that you should think about, and I urge you to take a look even at the dreaded Wikipedia, um, on the table of, I meant to bring in my computer to show you that, but look at the table of spherical harmonics, you will see the relationship between the spherical harmonics as polynomials of the spherical components. Let's say the spherical basis x plus or minus i, y, and z. So, uh, one defines what we call the solid harmonics. Scripty big one. The function of position is r to the l. YLM. These guys are polynomials in terms of the Cartesian, I'm sorry, the spherical basis, where m is equal to m1 minus m2, because this has m equals 0, this has m equals minus 1, this has m equals plus 1. If I do it to the mth power, I get that. 
and L and uh, one plus n two plus n two. So I sum over that weighted by coefficients that I depend on. So for example. Well, y0 zero, zero is a constant. I mean, all of these guys are 0, so y0 zero, zero is a constant. Let's look at the case L equals 1. Well, if L equals 1 and n equals 1, that is x plus i y to the 1. Right, because I have to sum these all these guys to one, and m has to be one. There's no other way to do it. That's then r sine theta e to the i phi, which is if we look back over there, the angular dependence. You know, time. This is a constant r y one one of theta and phi. So x plus or minus i y. is the function whose square, whose angular dependence is the angular dependence of y11. z, l equals 1, n equals 0, is r cos theta. This is some constant, r, y10. Right? Y10, cosine theta. What about x plus or minus i y to the power 2? Well, this has to be proportional to l equals 2, m equals 2, or plus or minus 2. It's the only part that can be And what is that? That's r squared sine squared theta e to the plus or minus i 2 phi. What about x plus i y times z? Well, that's l equals 2, m equals 1. That's r sine theta cos theta e to the i phi. Sine theta cos theta is sine 2 theta over 2. Works. So. Very important. If you really want to understand spherical harmonics, you need to understand the spherical basis. Because you really should think about spherical harmonics as polynomials in x plus or minus i, y, and z. And that, if we plug that in, gives us the relationship that is in Jackson between the spherical components of the multipole. Because I want to say one last thing and then we'll quit. So what we had here, we had the relationship between Cartesian and spherical. We have two different representations that we wrote. Okay, so what I have done here, these are the two different 
power series that we had. One in terms of Cartesian components and one in terms of spherical components. But they are indeed the same, just if they're related to one another. Here, although I have a sum over all these indices, there's really over a sum over 2L plus 1 different things, because there are only 2L plus 1 different independent components. Here I have a sum of 2L plus 1 different things. This polynomial is just the same as this polynomial. And my QLM sum is the integral So these polynomials are just the same as these polynomials. The difference is these are the real and imaginary parts of this complex. That's the relationship. Okay. I know I rushed through this last bit of it. I wanted to just give you a little bit of exposure. It's not that important, all of these details, but what is important in terms of manipulating and dealing with tensors is thinking about the spherical basis a little bit. I'd like to, you to urge you to think about that a little bit and then you can on your own. All right? All right, let us uh, call it quits.